Detroit, you're watching it live. These are houses that are never coming back. It's about the sanctity of human liberty and the cost of it if you want to take it. I know. Keep your head up. We just can't disappear. We just can't. If he's found guilty, it will break him. To stand up, fight back, is just incredible. Welcome to the David Rubenstein Atrium at Lincoln Center. I'm Becca Arnold and I'm the director of the Atrium. It's great to see so many new faces uh, and we welcome you and hope you'll come back uh, often. I'd like to thank Gail Brewer, our local council member who I see in the audience tonight who's given us tremendous support over the last few years. Thank you, Gail. I'd also like to welcome Council Member Elizabeth Crowley. In 2008, Council Member Crowley was elected to represent the 30th Council District in Queens. She was the first female and the first Democrat elected to represent that seat, which is great. Yes, let's clap for that. Uh, Council Member Crowley is dedicated to improving the communities she represents. The Queen's Ledger has hailed her as one of the hardest working members of the City Council. Um, we'd like to welcome you to say a few words. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Becca. Thank you for that very warm introduction. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'd like to give a shout out to my colleague, Council, Mayor, Council Member Gail Brewer, whose district we're in and who has work so hard to secure funds over the years to work with Lincoln Center and bring this atrium to the space that it is today and what a space it truly is. I, um, many people don't know this about me, but I'm a big supporter of the arts. I'm a council member from Queens who grew up in a Queens high school not knowing that I had artistic ability until I had a great art teacher. And then I uh, was able to put our art portfolio together and went to FIT and continued uh, studying art in graduate school, architecture and urban planning. So I know that it is a center here like Lincoln Center uh, and this atrium through the performances here that are free to the public, that you're able to educate so many young people and inspire in, in them a career in the arts, be it you know, uh, acting or painting or filmmaking. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight with our leader in the U.S. Congress, Nancy Pelosi, who's such a strong woman. An inspiration to me, I'm sure an inspiration to her daughter, Alexandra, who is also a very accomplished uh, woman, filmmaker and mother, and uh, just you know, a testament to us women that uh, then there's no obstacle uh, that you cannot overcome and never uh, give up on your dreams and keep on working hard to achieve your goals. Uh, this atrium in the last three years has welcomed over 800,000 people and visitors can enjoy food from the Witchcraft Cafe, free Wi-Fi, they can sign up for tours of the whole Lincoln Center campus and what a campus it is just across the street. and. Uh, there are free artistic programs here on Thursdays, sponsored by Target. Council Member Gail Brewer was telling me what impressive performances there are, and it's hard to get in here. So many New Yorkers do cherish the space. On Saturdays, they have Meet the Artists, where a lot of young people come to understand uh, groups like Just Films that are here at Atrium Fix. And tonight is 
the third in a six-part screening series here at the atrium in partnership with GIST Films, an initiative of the Ford Foundation. The series works to advance social justice worldwide through the talents of emerging and established filmmakers. Here to speak more about Just Films is Orlando Bagwell. He is the director of Just Films Initiative at the Ford Foundation. Mr. Bagwell has a distinguished career as an independent filmmaker. He's a producer spanning more than 25 years of work. His recent, sorry, his, his excellent work has been recognized with four Emmy Awards, numerous Emmy nominations, three George Peabody Awards, and the 1994 New York Film Festival Grand Prize. He has done tremendous work, and uh, it is my pleasure, lady and, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce you Orlando Bagwell. So is everybody ready for a good film today? Yeah. So I always do this, my name is Orlando Bagwell and uh, I direct the Just Films unit and I'd like to ask how many people here are here for the first time? Raise your hands. Oh, that's really one of them, it makes me really, really happy. Um, uh, we, um, this, is, this is our third program uh, of the year and um, I just want to talk to you a bit about uh, what's coming up next before we get into this program. Um, we, um, our next program on April 16th will be uh, with filmmaker Maya Nair and uh, interviewer Elvis Mitchell, and we'll be showing Mississippi Masala. And I think you'll get a little tease of that. Um, uh, following uh, in, um, in May, on May 14th, we will have uh, the New York filmmaker John Sayles here. And he will be interviewed by John Anderson, New York Times and other publications. And our last screening in June, on uh, June 4th, will be with Alan Berliner. And uh, the interviewer will be Richard Pena from Lincoln Center. So I hope that you will come back and join us for those uh, events and, uh, and uh, fill the house like you're doing today. This is really wonderful. Um, a few words about Ford. Ford Foundation um, is a social justice foundation. And we have offices throughout the world in 10 countries around the world and in New York. And um, uh, Just Films uh, uh, represents a film fund within the foundation. And it seeks to uh, support courageous filmmakers um, from around the world whose work address critical issues in meaningful and compelling ways. Um, our partnership with Lincoln Center uh, is, is really set up so that we can feature uh, the work and the thinking of some of the most exciting filmmakers in the United States. And it fits well in our belief that uh, the potential, that we believe that filmmaking has potential uh, to be a valuable, valuable tool in the search for uh, justice in the world and a valuable tool in the process of making that happen. So uh, I thank you for joining us today and being a part of uh, what we like to do at the Ford Foundation. So no more ads. <laughs> thank you. I want to talk about today's program and, to, and, and today's filmmaker. I must say, as a filmmaker myself, it is really exciting when you, uh, when you meet a new original voice, and that voice emerges on the filmmaker se filmmaking scene and makes a loud noise. And I think that's what the work of Alexandra Pelosi is all about. She has made a loud noise since her first film um, that I remember seeing, which was, was Journeys with George. And, um, and it's so, 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 we're so excited that she's going to be our featured filmmaker today. Um, there is something very intimate and always unexpected in Alexander's films. Um, she often uses our, our fascination and hunger for celebrities to delve into our shared insecurities, our precarious stance with failure, and our familiar flirt with our own vulnerability. And it's kind of rare when a filmmaker can bring those things out, yet at the same time, allow us to be entertained and allow us to find drama in people's lives. I remember when I saw uh, Alexandra's first uh, long-form documentary, Travels with George, there I saw an essayist that was kind of deeply embedded in the deep tradition of direct cinema. 
It was a train, with a trained camera focused on the action. She was a filmmaker who also questioned and commented um, and, and inquired and became an active participant in an unfolding dramatic story, whether it was an election, a story of poverty and homelessness, or a day-to-day uh, -day process of personal reinvention and interrogation. It was her voice as well as her camera that allowed us to have access to those things through a person, through an individual, and through a group of individuals. Um, she's an example of the 21st century kind of in-your-face filmmaking, in a sense. She, um, it, uh, but hers is a, is a probing, caring, and smart kind of camera in your face. Um, her use of cinema and voice always opens a new door and allows us to place um, and, and in places we don't really expect to ever visit. And I think you'll see that today in this film. Um, I remember when I first saw our first film with, um, when, she, uh, when, she, with, with, uh, when I saw a moment in one of her films on John McCain when she was following his campaign, and she encountered a group of tailgaters um, who were talking about the election of Ob uh, Barack Obama. And they were drinking beer and sitting out in front of a, a NASCAR race. You could hear the, the cars in the background. And they began to talk about the meaning of this election. And you could tell that um, in their voice there was a kind of honest yet sad insight into a nation that's deeply ambivalent about issues of inequality, issues of class, and issues of opportunity. But in that moment, you realize that they were speaking to all of us. They were speaking something that we all felt. And this is the kind of thing that Alexander could so easily bring out of the characters she would present to us in her films. And I think you'll see, as I said, you'll see this today. Her films are insightful and funny and uniquely her perspective. And, um, and I think that um, as we look at, we have a, the great privilege of seeing her film today, which will premiere on HBO on Thursday, I believe, uh, on Jim McGreevy, uh, the uh, former governor of New Jersey called Far From, Fall From Grace. Um, one of the things we also like to do is introduce you to exciting interviewers in this series. We invite, we have in, uh, interviewers that we uh, and that we invite to the stage to be a part of this uh, effort with us. And joining Alexander on stage as a, as the interviewer is HBO's vice president of documentary programming, Lisa Heller. Um, Lisa Heller, <laughs> yes, please applaud. Um, she develops and promotes a wide range of documentary films for her home box office. She came to HBO in, two th in the year 2000 with the critically from the critically acclaimed PBS series POV, where they actually had to beg her and steal her away from there, but they got her. And where she was executive producer, uh, she oversaw programming and all related broadcast activities in that position. And uh, she began as a filmmaker herself, so she has an understanding of the language and the work. And I must say, she is the love of my life. <laughs> I'm gonna admit this, I have to do it in all, in all transparency, and the wonderful, wonderful mother of my young son. So please invite Alexander Pelosi and Lisa Heller to, stage, to the stage for a brief conversation, and then their films. himself there. I wasn't sure if he was going to tell everybody if he, you were the mother of his child. I, know, I'm I was going to, so I'm just glad he did it so I didn't have to. Alexandra. We've made eight films together. Did he make that point? No, we've made many films together. Eight we've lived films. many lives together. We've been I've through prepared a lot. so many notes that I'm sure I won't get to. How about hello? Thank hello, you all for everybody. coming. We're really happy you're here. It was going to be really awkward if we had to sit in a room by ourselves and have a conversation. Yeah. Although, Although we, we do have that. done that. <laughs> we, we do. Um, happy Passover, Alexandra. Thank you. Happy Easter. Thank you for taking the time out of uh, your very busy schedule. It's actually my mother's birthday. She didn't want me to mention that. Um, and we had a wonderful celebration. My Thank son you. Thomas, who's five, told me I had to tell you that we, he made a cake for her today, which we enjoyed. That's why they're so um, yeah, over sugared we, right now. We would also like to thank Nancy and your dad, Paul, for making you, producing Alexander Pelosi. Right. But we don't have to thank him because he didn't show up tonight. No, no, no. But we, we only show thank up for him. the thank and people to show up. And we should thank uh, Mihail Voss for My producing husband. many of the films that we have been lucky enough to show on HBO and producing with Alexandra these wonderful children. Um, and have any of you seen any of the films that we've made together? 
One, we have one, we have one. We have an audience of one. Well, funny you should mention that. Which one was it? Wait, hold on, let's see if he's just saying that to be polite. I Which have one? two pages of notes. Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay, good. All right. Thank you. Thank you that was for a good watching. One. That was a good one. I've got a big following. Yeah. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. But okay, it's okay. He didn't want to see another one after that, I guess. So it's okay. It's lucky then that we toiled away at the home box office to pull promos, ancient promos off the shelf, to right. try to show you little bits and pieces of... Um, each of Alexandra's films, so you would know what we were blathering on about. Right, and I will say, this has been my life. I mean, I've spent the last decade working every day with Lisa, toiling in the trenches at HBO. No, actually, really out in America. Yeah, I've been sent, I don't act, I live in New York, but I don't get to work here. I have to go out into America. My actual assignment is America, so I go out into Real America, as they say. Mm -hmm. And I'm from San Francisco, and I live in New York. That's my world experience right there. So you know when I say real America, I'm saying it with a smile. But uh, I go out into America, so I've had to spend basically the better half of the last 10 years out in real America so that you didn't have to. <laughs> and still, you didn't even watch. Right. But in all seriousness, Alexandra is one of our most mm. beloved filmmakers. She has this thing that all docu-filmmakers have, which is they're curious, but she's insatiably curious. She's ferociously curious. And she goes out with what, I mean, I think you're gonna make a joke of this, but I think this is true. Um, incredible wide-eyed wonder and a lack of cynicism about America. And we ship her out. It doesn't matter if she's in labor, having babies, whatever, we send her out on the road and she comes back with something that is always surprising. And, um, and I think she's still curious, which is amazing after a decade of this stuff. I think the reason why they like me at HBO is because I have a philosophy that no story <laughs> needs to be more than 45 minutes. Because filmmakers really, I love documentary films. I really watch everything. I remember I've, this got you into trouble once. This got me into trouble once because I said to a New York Times reporter, never talk to a New York Times reporter. Okay. <laughs> note, to said, note to self. Note to self. What I said was, I will repeat this, this will be on my tombstone. What I said was, people think documentaries are boring. The opening line was, Alexander Pelosi says, quote, documentaries are boring. <laughs> and I, th that's what I've been doing with my whole life. But the point was, people think they're boring because they think, oh, now I have to learn something. Oh, no, now I have to pay attention. Oh, God, I don't even know where this is in it's the world. What, what country is this? I don't, and then that's why they changed the channel, right? And a lot of people lie about, I'm glad nobody here did, thank you. People usually say, oh, yes, I, I've seen your documentaries. And then if I ask them a question, I realize that they haven't. It's, it's okay, but they, they feign interest. And what they have seen is they've seen me talking about it on Stephen Colbert, or they've seen me talking about it on Good Morning America, but they didn't, so they know enough to pretend that they saw it. Which is why we're going to force you to watch some clips today. But the good news about the film you're going to see tonight is it's 40 minutes. <laughs> that's true. So, but that's wait, 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 wait. I'm taking this interview back. <laughs> good luck. Were you, let's, let's rewind for a minute. Were you always this shy? <laughs> No, you seriously, talk about... Mother, was I always this shy? <laughs> okay. Smart lady. You grew up in a small town. She tried to rein me in. Here's <laughs> the thing. I made a movie about George Bush. In, okay, I was a journalist. I'm going to tell you my life story. I'm going to overshare, and I'll try and do so it in like one start, minute or less. You grew up in a okay. small town of San Francisco. It's not that small town. They have an okay. opera. They have the San Francisco Giants, okay. the San Francisco 49ers. Good. Should and, we take offence that you're calling it a small town? And were you always interested anyway, in grew, the media? I grew up in San Francisco, <laughs> and I always wanted to be a journalist. I... It was the, you know, all the president's men. I grew up in that era of we idolized journalists. And when I told my mother I was going to be a journalist, she cried and she said, what have I done to deserve this? <laughs> and I had a great, healthy respect for the world of journalism. Wait, didn't you have a radio show at age four or something? You're bringing up really sensitive topics. She doesn't want to go. Oh, yeah. I did have a graveyard shift radio show that I didn't tell my parents about. And then my mother heard me when she got into a taxi cab at like six in the morning when she was going to the airport. It, it didn't end well, that story. How old so, were you when you had that show? High school. Yeah, I used to sneak out of the house. I'm, I can say this now, I'm 42 years old, right? <laughs> 
I used to sneak out of the house to do a radio show at KUSF, the university radio station in San Francisco, which is like the best radio station in America. And so, I always wanted to be a journalist. I'm going to try and get through this quickly because I can tell my kids are rolling their eyes over there. So what happened was, I wanted to be a journalist and then I was assigned to cover, I spent a decade at NBC News. I mean, I'm talking when disaster struck Columbine, Lady Diana car crash, uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. car, they would call me. I was the news nun. They would call me, I'd never have anything going on in my life. They'd say, you need to go to, call, you need to, go to Littleton, you need to go to England, you need to go to, I'd have to go places where bad things happened. And somehow there's an adrenaline rush, I can't explain it. It's like, that happens in journalism. The journalist is a great profession. One day I was sitting at my desk and I got a phone call and they said, I'm telling you the story of how I became a documentary filmmaker. Okay. okay I was sitting at my desk at NBC News in 1999 I'm just leave. and the phone rang. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the story of how I became right, a go, filmmaker. Go, 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 go. So the phone rang and the guy goes, uh, the, the gentleman, the assignment editor said, do you have any pets? And I said, no. Why? He said, we need someone to cover the Bush campaign. That was how I got the job. I was available. I had no pets, I had no children, I had no husband, I had no connect. So they sent me to Austin, Texas, and they got me an apartment. And I lived, and I covered George Bush from the minute he announced he was running for president until the minute he was sworn in in Washington, D.C. Okay, that's a great intro to this clip. But before we go there. Oh, we're doing clips already? I was going to tell the rest of my life story. Oh, no, no, no. Because it was... Okay, here's okay. the thing. So what Finish. happened was I fell out of love with journalism. Being on the bus, living, breathing with journalists every day for a year and a half. All of a sudden, I realized something would happen on the campaign trail. And then I would read about it in the New York Times, and I'd say, I was there. That's not how I remember it to ha have happened. It was like a car accident. You could see it from your own... It, the fuselage of a plane, mm. different... People saw things from different perspectives, but I remember one night when George Bush lost a primary and the New York Times wrote, he was shell-shocked and reeling from his loss. And I said, he was wearing these silly sleep goggles and making jokes about who was making out with who on the airplane. That was not shell-shocked and reeling, that was George Bush being a frat boy. That was, so it was just an interpretation or maybe it was just, that was the story they wanted to write so they wrote it because they wanted a race. I don't know. The point is I fell out of love with journalism and I had my little handheld camera and I was filming what was going on on the bus and on the plane and when I got back, I quit my job at NBC and in my living room, I made the film Journeys with George. Now you can play the clip. Wait, 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 no. <laughs> I get to say that something. That was a perfect cue. No, it was a perfect cue, but it was also, an, you made a very interesting distinction. The distinction between being a journalist and being an artist slash filmmaker. And I think the folks at Ford and Lincoln Center are interested in you as an artist. Did we thank the Ford Foundation? We didn't. Did we? No, I'll do it at home. Okay. <laughs> did, we thank Link did we thank Lincoln Center? No, we, we didn't. should thank Lincoln Center. For giving and us the Ford Foundation. For give and the Ford Foundation for giving us somebody to talk to, because we'd be having this conversation here with or without you. That's true. So I want to thank you Maybe guys in the for, back for, for, some for, wine, but for getting yeah. them to show up. Yes, and, for and all the also the things. HBOers who pulled together to get us here tonight, Ashiba, Lana, Jerry, everyone who helped us get here in the middle of a busy press week. Um, well, okay, we can anyway, play the clip now. So no, no, no. I, Orlando, is this true? We're supposed to talk about Alexander. Art. Exact, We're talking uh, about art. We were talking about falling out of love with journalism, segue into, I had a story, I wanted to tell that, so I wanted to share that experience of what it was like to live with the presidential candidate. Right. And then I was saying, okay, I'll talk about the art. Okay. What's your process? It was the only film he'd seen. One guy had seen that film, just one guy. Oh, So shush. that means it was the only art we, that... We All right, Godfrey, let's just show the clip. <laughs> I think it's the only thing to do. Oh. That's me. <laughs> You're kidding. 2001, wow. But we start today, right here, and I hope you'll join me. God bless you all, and God bless America. When George W. Bush announced that he was running for president, I packed my bags and left my home in New York City to join the Bush Traveling Press Corps. My assignment as a network news producer was to cover Bush's entire campaign. I'm not the one you see on TV. I'm the hired help behind the scenes. See, that's me reporting for duty in Iowa on my way to my first Bush interview. 
that bad. Miss Pelosi, how are you? Hi. I didn't get a chance to officially introduce myself to you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I've always you. liked your stylishness. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we especially like the purple. Yeah. That obviously that, that is your favorite is very color. Cool. Huh? Yeah. Are we going to go with perpetual purple glasses throughout the entire campaign? The purple wardrobe isn't all that I packed. I brought my camcorder along, and what you're about to see is my home movie of my year-long road trip with this man in his race to become leader of the free world. Wow, look who's coming down the street. I can hear them jingling jangling spurs all the way down here. Now, is this movie going to be called George and Alexander? Is that the name of this movie? I don't know. What do you think it should be called? Uh, Journeys with George? Pretty good one, huh? You getting any spell with a G? G, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it's conditional love. One condition is that I can't ask him about the record number of executions taking place in Texas. You're sure, you sleep at night knowing that everyone that has been put to death on your watch was completely guilty of that. Huh? Alexander, let me put it to you this way. I'm sleeping safely, soundly at night. Thank you for the question. See you all later. This is what happens when you bite the man who feeds you. I'm not answering your questions. Why not? Because you came after me the other day. You went below the belt. So now he's teaching me the rules of engagement. If I throw him a hardball, he'll push me into the outfield. And it's my job to maintain my network's relationship with the candidate. That's art. <laughs> what is it? What do you feel when you look back at it now? I was trying to show the symbiotic relationship between the press and the candidate and how you live on a plane. They feed you every single meal and you're supposed to report on them and you're supposed to ask them tough questions, but then you have to go and get back on the plane with them. And they can throw you off the plane if they want, but you, it's in your interest for your candidate to go as far as possible. And this is some dirty little secret about journalism that journalists will not tell you. They're all secretly rooting for their candidate because they know if he wins, they get to be the White House correspondent. And all the people that were on that plane with me, God bless them, got great careers out of it. David Gregory was my correspondent. Campbell Brown was my correspondent. These are people who went far. And who covered Al Gore? Quick, name them. <laughs> you can't, right? Because so, and people are people. You know, you stay up late at night and you have conversations about them. We'd say, oh, it's so weird. We can't ask them about, why don't we ask them about that? Oh, I can't ask him about that. You ask him. No, I'm not asking him. You ask. And it becomes just like high school. Everyone, it's summer camp, really. And f these are sophi sophisticated, respected journalists that we're talking about. Speaking to. of which, there's one journalist on that plane who everyone in the film refers to as Newsweek guy, right? Who at some point, I just watched the film again, says something kind of interesting, which is, you are actually the most brilliant journalist on the plane because you play a wacky gal and then hit him. Okay, but what's more interesting than that is what Richard Wolff says on the plane because they probably know who Richard Wolff is. He yeah. works at NBC, MSNBC. He said at the end of the movie, I feel like we all just drank the Kool-Aid and we all just reported what they told us to report. It's like, we, it, you know, we all we did was critique the other planes uh, we, we lived in a bubble, and he admitted that he felt sort of dirty about being an accomplice. And, and how do you feel like Journeys with George was different? Well, I feel like I could at least reveal, and, and even then you have to be a little careful because I didn't want the White House to come after me and destroy my life, which they easily could have done. The, 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 <laughs> in my opinion, the, uh, the real accomplishment was that I got to release the movie, and they were happy with it. And they never, they thought that George Bush looked fine in the movie. It was a Rorschach test. If you didn't like Bush, you thought, what a frat boy. And if you liked him, he said, see, he's such a nice guy. Look at the way he's drinking those Buckler's beers. And so it was interesting that everybody saw who they wanted to see. And so I didn't go too far. There's, there's a line. Is there something you would have 
you look back and you wish you had asked or done being on that plane with George Bush? Well, I feel like he was completely uh, given a free pass in anything related to, well, first of all, you, you have to remember, what qualifications did I have to be sitting on a bus for a year and a half to be reporting to you, to the world, about this man? What, what were, were, I was you, a news nun. I mean, what, what did I know about international foreign policy? I, I say, and I, I, my mother would say, why do you say these things? I, I would say, she would probably say, well, you had a career, it's 10 years as a journalist. I would say, I knew nothing about the situation in the Middle East. And, I, and then 9-11 happened, so then and people film, say, how did we get this president? And you're like, well, well it sounds we like didn't ask you the questions. Think this film, and maybe others, are actually more about the media than about the subject right. of the film. Well, I've always been much more interested in the media than I have because they go into America. Remember I said I have to go into America? I go places. I go to places still for HBO. I, I go into America and I do these little pieces. Like I did a piece for Bill Maher on Friday night. I also work for Bill Maher. And I do these little pieces that are like two minutes long. And I went to New Jersey and I talked to people about, so what do you think we should cut? They're like, I'm Tea Party. I hate this government. So what should we cut? Should we cut unemployment? No. Should we cut education? No. Should we cut Social Security? No. Should we cut Medicare? No. Should we cut the war fund? No. Should we cut the standard relief? No. Okay, then what should we cut? Oh, the senator's salaries. <laughs> and you're like, NBC News media headquarters, Fox, every media outlet in America is right here within a mile of where we're sitting. They could get on the pathway and go to New Jersey like I did. It took 20 minutes to get there and ask this question and find out that, you know, we're having conversations about budget cuts and fiscal cliff and sequestration and everyone's like, yeah, cut them, we hate government. Well, oh, but don't cut my sanity relief. Don't go cutting my Medicare. Don't go cutting my... So there are those kind of... It's so easy to me. It seems so simple. Have a real conversation. And it feels like the media isn't having a real conversation because I would argue that they're just too in bed w with the status quo, the, the access issue. They need access. Spoken so they like a true hbo -er. <laughs> <laughs> Um Speaking of which, we should qualify that we had, as Alexandra portrayed, nothing to do with Journeys with George. Sheila likes to say it showed up. I think Alexandra sent it in an envelope and landed on somebody's desk and we opened it. But then we saw the movie Magic. And so and none of you are film students? Do we have any film students here? No, we don't. Oh, we have oh. some. Okay. Oh. oh, we do. That's so good. Um, What's because point? the What's point, point is, after you finish a film, you're unemployed. <laughs> Thursday night, this is going to air. The movie you're going to watch is going to air. And then I'm going to be sitting on my couch robo-calling Lisa, trying to get her to pick up my call about the next project. <laughs> because that's what documentary filmmaking is. So you may want to think about it's that. Um, <laughs> because some people think, oh, you make films for HBO, and then they think that you, you live in a you know, happy few. You see names on the board of like, oh, documentary filmmakers, they have this blessed, life is beautiful when you're beautiful. Actually, what happens is when you finish a film, you go to Sundance, you have your toast of the town. They have wine and cheese for All right, you. The tough love session with Alexander and will then, be in the back. Then I'll the bet you, seriously, come back Monday morning and just see where we, that's, explain that because you have people calling you every day saying, can I make this film? Like, oh, famous filmmakers too, right? My point was <laughs> <laughs> that after we saw Journeys with George and aired it, we thought Alexandra should go back out on the road. And She's queuing up a clip. And Let's go cue that clip. <laughs> Let's keep this conversation going. I think we should keep it going because I think it's interesting what happened next. And what happened next was Diary of a Political Tourist in two, on the, which campaign? 2004. Right. I think we're ready for the clip. Notice all the time in between each film, too. It takes a long time to make this thing. In 2000, I took a year-long road trip with George Bush, and we made a movie together. This time around, I went on the road with the Democrats to see what it takes to try and kick the leader of the free world out of the White House. Are you going to be the star of my next movie? Yes. Do you think your husband's a movie star? No. Am I the next victim? In my vision of America's future, there will be a place for fried Twinkies. Everyone in their mother wanted the chance to race against Bush. Somehow, this Vietnam War hero ended up as the last man standing. You can't take a private walk. You know you're gonna get 50 camera crews behind you if you do. I didn't know that. People are expecting me to show them a side of John Kerry they've never seen. Okay, here I go. <laughs> Alexander Pelosi's Diary of a Political Tourist. She's dangerous with this camera. No, she's not. <laughs> 
Okay, I have an interesting point to make about this film. I was going to ask a question. This is the only film that I have made of the eight films that I've made for HBO that is not out on DVD. That, that, I mean, I know you're all dying to rush to Netflix <laughs> to get it, but you can't. I'm sure it's on HBO. Because, oh. I'll tell you why. Yeah. What did I tell you about when your candidate wins? At least one guy saw that movie. When, your can when the candidate you're covering doesn't win, it's a different story. And there, there's just not the demand. There was never this great demand. After the election, HBO mm -hmm. didn't say, oh my, if he had won, there mm -hmm. would have been this insatiable appetite for anything John Kerry. Hmm. Ironically, you know, you never know the life cycle of any well, of these. he's busy. There might be a new demand. But, but see what I'm saying? That's another part of documentary filmmaking. If you'd been on the Romney campaign, as somebody was, at the, I said it a year ago to the people making the Romney video. That's great, you want to make a film about Romney. But if he doesn't win, good luck trying to distribute that. We still thought it was a great film. Oh, I did and too. And I think what's interesting about it is when you, the film opens, and you can all see it on HBO Go. It's very accessible. Um, <laughs> Um, Plug. Is, isn't this the one where you're in the White House at the party in the beginning? Yes. And the guy tells Alexandra to turn off the camera. She brings her camera to the White House Christmas party. And she's walking around <laughs> giving us inside access, which I think is actually part of the fun of some of your films. But somehow the camera doesn't get turned off. So let's talk about this thing, relationship you have with permission to shoot and access. Okay. I said on the film you're going to watch tonight that I come from the Karl Rove School of Filmmaking. It's better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. <laughs> I saw him in the green room at George Stephanopoulos on Sunday and I was uh, saying that during the campaign in 2000, he would walk up to me and say, what are you doing with that camera? I said, ah, I'm just filming. And said, oh, I get it. You're from the, it's better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. I like that. The HBO so, lawyers love that. Yeah, I don't get releases. I don't believe in them. I don't have a cameraman. I, am, I film everything with a handheld. You all probably have better cameras that you shoot your own lives with. I know that all of my nephews do. They're all teenagers. They have much nicer cameras. Too. My nephew called me. He said, I'm running for vice president of my class. Can you watch the video I made? It looked nicer than... Some, some of the of things I've stuff. shot in the movie you're going to see. Tell him to mail it in. I'm serious. <laughs> no, but I'm saying, like, they, th these kids today, they get these cameras, and that's my school. If I, I believe that there's no such thing as a human moment anymore with a camera because of publicists, because of Michael Moore. You know, everybody knows they're going to look silly, so nobody wants a camera around. So what I do is I bring a small handheld camera, and I film a little bit, I don't sit there like a Japanese tourist filming every single thing, like walking through Times Square. I do just little, like I'll go to Jim McGreevy's house for a day and I'll film five minutes. And of that, I'll two minutes. Jim McGreevy, the star of the film you'll be seeing tonight, said no 13, 14, 15 times. His he partner. didn't sign the release to be in the film until we were leaving to go to Sundance. We didn't know we could go to Sundance because yeah, it was really he fun. hadn't signed the release. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I believe in relationships with people. I meet people. I ask them if I can hang out with them. If they say yes, I trust them. And I've never been sued. Have I ever been sued? I've never had any problem with anyone I've ever filmed. Because I, get people, I, I have a relationship with people. That's what my filmmaking style is based on. I go to people's homes. I hang out with them for a weekend. I film a little bit. And then I make a movie about it. And I think I, I never take them out of context and make them look... Everyone brings their own stuff to what they're seeing. Right. And you respect that. Just getting back to Diary for a second, because there was this um, moment that we loved in the film with Cindy Crawley, who said, how did it get so ridiculous? Because an experiment watched is an experiment changed. If, yes, you take on, if you take cameras and put them on something, it's going to change it, right? If I put a camera in your face, you're going to act differently. You're going to fix your hair, you're going to put on some lipstick, you're going to sit up, right? But if I have my little camera, I'm sitting in your, I'm in your living room, and I just sort of like sit there, and I just kind of turn it on, you're not even sure if I'm taking a picture, you're not sure, you're, then it's different, because you don't feel like you're being watched. You feel like you have a friend over who's filming some clips that may or may not air on HBO. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, also what Candy was saying, I think, if I'm remembering it correctly, was, you know, we sit here and criticize the process, but the media made the process. 
And you went around corn dog, fried Twinkie after fried Twinkie in this film to come away with what? What did you learn about the political process on that well, tour? What I learned was sort of what we just learned in the last campaign. I'm not saying anything about our president. I'm just saying they ran for how many years were those Republicans running? And you think, oh my, these jokers, one after the other. Remember Herman Cain? You know, oh, they'd have a flavor of the month, they fell in love with them, and then, and, and you realize just something about the political process, which is they fall in love, and then they follow, their, then they, go, they start to think it through, and then they think, well, who can win? And by then, they've damaged the candidate. They, they're all so damaged that none of them have a chance, mm -hmm. right? If, if they had been smarter about it in 2004, or in 2000, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the candidates that were running, I'm just saying, it, I really think it's the media. I mean, it's Puts the Howard them on the Dean cover of the example, magazine right? and says, this is the most, this is the flavor of the month, this is who's popular. This is. Michelle Bachman, she's the front runner, really? We all knew Michelle Bachman was never gonna be president. But the media has a way, they put, their, they put her on the cover of the Time magazine. Right. They said she was. And in the film, we saw Howard Dean. What, did, what was your line? It was death by a thousand edits with the scream, right? I mean, it was something that the media contributed to in terms of where we landed with him. Right, and now I think it's so scary that what you have to endure to run for president has nothing to do with substance and nothing. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with our candidates, I'm just saying. And it's your fault, the media. I would say, I would, I would argue that it's the process because it's like a, you're, you're making them jump through these hoops that are totally, the job description doesn't fit the job. I mean, yeah. you make them eat fried Twinkies on a stick. Yeah. That's what the job description is. Go to the Iowa, St Iowa State Fair and eat as many fried Twinkies on a stick as you can. Mm -hmm. And the reporters are going to say, how many did you eat? Right. And, oh, well, John McCain ate this many, and Joe Lieberman ate this many, and yeah. they make it, somehow they have a way of trivial trivializing all of it and making every little word you say they can use against right. you. Right. And it's not an interesting conversation. It's just, you know, the media likes to stir the pot and turn it into a... <laughs> Let's so, see the next. My mother no. says it's time to see the next. Okay. Clip. So are you ready to Maybe find she God? Maybe needs to get in the chair. Are you ready Should to find swap? God? Can I go back to my George Bush story? So no, I no. like to visit George Bush now. So that why? I made a film about him and we're friends. So I am friends. You know what I'm saying? But so I went to visit him, and he said to me this many years later. He said, "I always liked your mother because she never broke your spirit," and I thought that was so telling about his mother. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we're going to find God with the evangelicals who were so, you know, such a big part of that. Right. So the reason I made run. the next film was because in all of these elections, they always talk about the power of the evangelical Christians, not this past election. But remember in 2004, when George Bush was reelected, the media narrative was the evangelical Christians, they're so powerful. So I was, who are these evangelical Christians? We've got to go meet some because I don't know any in New York, although you have one in your office. Answering your phone. Time to cue the clip. Oh. <laughs> I'm Alexandra Pelosi, and I'm grabbing my camera and hitting the road to meet some evangelical Christians. What are some swinging guys like you doing in church? There's nothing else like this. There's no other place to be, man. So you're all high on Jesus. Jesus and ain't coming down. This looks like it hurts. When you think of the pain Christ went through on the cross for us, this pales in comparison. Do you know all the surveys say evangelicals have the best sex life of any other group? Is this the church of the future? I know we are. Evangelicals lead many different lives. When God gets a hold of your heart, he can change a lot of things. But together, they're a formidable force in our culture and our democracy. Evangelicals are the largest minority bloc in this country. I don't think you can win without them. Al Gore learned that, and Hillary will learn it in 2008. It's a new day. I really believe there's a spiritual awakening taking place. Friends of God, a road trip with Alexander Pelosi. I believe that the family is the foundation for everything that's going to happen in America, good or bad. In the Garden of Eden, God established family before anything else. Adam had wife and the wife had a husband. 
There was one man, one woman, and it was for the procreation of the human race. That's what God established first. Look, the gang is all here. Why don't we all get in good order for it to get a good picture of us all here? Yeah. <laughs> it must be so much fun. It is fun. Having all these people to play with. <laughs> Just make you want to have a dozen children now. What's wrong with American culture today is we have left biblical principle. 50, 60 years ago, the American family was mom and dad, and there was 8, 10, 12 children. That was the norm. When I met my husband, I was in my third year of college, and I told him that, you know, I might live with you, I might make some commitments, but I will not marry you, and if I did, I would never have a family because I'm not interested in that. I didn't play with dolls as a child. I'm going to be a lawyer, then a powerful politician, and I'm going to be the first woman president. And now I have 10 children just 18 years later, so when God gets a hold of your heart, He can change a lot of things. You look like Ken and Barbie. That's you then. Now well, this is you now. Yes. This is before. This is before. And after. That's right. You know, when, when families are right, then the church is strong, then the nation is strong. I want my children in the first formative years of their life to, to learn the Word of God and the principles of true Christianity. I homeschool my children because I want to pour in them truth, not error. So you, have your, you have your own school here. You've got 10, yes. you've got your hands full. Yes, I love it. It's the best part. If I had someone else to do the cooking and cleaning, we'd just school all the time. And what a, what a way to strengthen your relationship with your children. It's just been wonderful, it's really, it really has. <laughs> I just don't know anyone else that has a better life than me. It's the greatest. I mean, every minute, it's something that's eternal. I get to enjoy every minute with my children. Now there are times, you know, that I'm just like, oh, what have I done? I can't, I can't handle this. I can't wash another dish. I can't cook another meal. But if I could change anything around here, it would only be the noise level. <laughs> What's funny is that most people I know would think being home all day with 10 kids is a nightmare. <laughs> well, you know, if your family is fitting into your life, like, you know, your life is your work or your club or your hobbies or whatever, then your family is, is hard to deal with. But if your family is your life, even if there's 15 of them, that's your life. And you grew into it, you know, one at a time. And, and so it's just a joy. It's, it's wonderful. It must be weird having people like us from New York, like the, the hell on earth. It must be weird. Yeah. There's, hill, there's, there's hillbillies just as bad as the New Yorkers. <laughs> so, what do you want to say about that scene? One of the guys putting this reel together said that was one of the most important, you, you told him it was one of the most important scenes in your career. Well, the reason so I, why would they let I you think in? it shows I have a respect for those people. I'm not mocking them. I genuinely believe being home with children all day would be a curse. <laughs> But, <laughs> I don't have a nanny, I raise my own kids, right guys? I mean, I, t I just take them with me. Because she, had, she made such a good point in that movie. She says, well you guys are just fitting your families into your life. You don't have your values right. And that was really, um, I thought, how did you find them? How did you get in there? Why did they let you in? You're saying, I, no wonder I've <laughs> never been invited to your house. <laughs> okay. I'm, no, I went to church to watch Ken Ham, who cre has a creation museum in Kentucky. He was teaching at a church, and he, they were singing these songs to the children about how there's no such thing as dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were in the Bible. There's no such thing as evolution. It's all intelligent design. And they sang songs about how behemoth is a dinosaur, a dinosaur is he... To make no the point, no intelligent, des okay. intelligent design is in the Bible, therefore everything in is in the Bible and the, the earth was started so right there in the Bible. So you met this family. I met them at the church when they were singing songs to the kids. And then I said, um, can I come home with you? Was that so weird? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they were very but open. But see, New Yorkers, if I walked around this room after this and I said, hi, can I come home with you? Probably all of you would be like, oh, God, no. But in America, they let me spend the night. They're really welcoming. I'm always surprised. Now this, at this point, I'd met my husband and I was traveling with my husband 
And we would go into people's homes and they would invite us to spend the night. They'd say, stay for dinner, stay for a week. And we were always sort of stunned by how nice they were to us. Yeah. Because we knew that they would have, like if, if you were walking through Times Square and you saw some couple from Kentucky with 10 kids, would you say, why don't you guys go spend the night at my house? But they um, somehow did, did for us, which was. Yeah. So another nice person you met was Ted Haggard in this film. Okay. So Ted Haggard at the time was the head of the National Association of Evangelicals. He was the spokesman for the evangelicals in America. Mm -hmm. And we made this film that was a, just a nice portrayal of evangelicals, what they believe, who they are. And we delivered it to HBO because I was pregnant with my son, Paul. And I had to go into labor and, you know, with movies, you can go on for years. I mean, you can edit forever. You can just keep going. And at some point, you have to just give birth and say, I'm done, right? So I said, actually, my son is about due, so I'm going to have to wrap this film up. So I went and delivered the film to HBO. I'd worked a couple years on it. At some point, it was like, I think I got it. Enough, yeah. And, you know, there's always, that's the thing with these films. You don't know, you could, you could film. For, anyway, so I delivered the film to HBO. I went to St. Vincent's Hospital to give birth. And then they called. The fall. Um, Ted, Hag it was in the news. I was literally in the hospital and I saw evangelical preacher Ted Haggard admits to going to a male prostitute and doing dr methamphetamines. Excuse me, I just made a film in which he's the moral authority of the entire film. The moral plumb line. So I had to go back into the edit room uh, with, with child. The next day, yeah. Right, like yeah. with, it was like yeah. brand newborn. Yeah. That was when they just slept a lot. Yeah. And, and sit there and re-edit. And then Pastor Ted was kicked out of the state of Colorado. His church said, you have to leave Colorado. You're excommunicated, whatever it is, it's leave. And he moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. And you cannot make this stuff up. Let's my, watch. Let's watch. Wait, but my sister calls me. Yeah. Hey, I just like the accidental nature of life. My sister calls me. She lives in Scottsdale, Arizona. She says, a friend of mine was in the supermarket the other day, and you know who she saw? Ted Haggard. Because <laughs> he was news that he had been excommunicated and sent off, but no one knew where he was. He was like in the witness he protection program. Exile. And my sister's friend saw him in the grocery store. And so... I think you called and said, I, 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 I want to go stalk So Ted I got on a plane, and I went to Scottsdale, Arizona, yeah. and I went looking for Ted Haggard, and I found him. Scottsdale, Arizona easy to find him and so let's watch the clip okay one of the most powerful evangelical leaders of our time please welcome Ted Hagen. I'm living a pretty good life I love this one shocking scandal brought his world crashing down. Reverend Ted Haggard said that he bought crystal meth from Mike Jones, the male prostitute who says Haggard paid him for sex. I went there for a massage. What we have here is someone who in leadership has failed the standard that he lifted up for himself. He just needs to disappear. So this is my new life, Village Inn, Motel 6 or 8. I didn't make any money this week. Boss money big time, boss money out on half. Gay, straight, bisexual, what are you, Ted Haggard? I stuck with him because I believe you fight for the good. Somebody struggling with sin is the purpose that the church is on earth. Now I've lost my career, I've lost my social standing, I've lost all my positions. So in this stage of my life, I'm a loser. Hmm. That's quite a promo. So that's Ted. So you're so I found at out your the golf sister's house in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I walked up and I said, "Pastor Ted, what happened to the poor Pastor crowd? Ted? Where did on top of go? everything, he has to run into Alexandra at the, on the golf course." <laughs> and then, did you have your little camera? I did. You know, there was a scene in that movie. You mm -hmm. don't, really, you don't remember that? No. no. Yeah. Uh, no I was wondering if you approached him first with the camera because they were very stung by the media at that point. You can't really tell from this promo, but they really, really took a beating. Right. And I remember you like moving into your poor sister's house and stalking him a little bit, maybe before you took right. the camera. The line of stalker and documentary filmmaker is very thin. <laughs> it is, it is. But eventually he trusted you with his fall story. I always thought it was because he was in love with my husband. He always, I, in that case, I have to give credit where credit was due. He, he always was sort of interested in, remember the one scene, we had a scene we wanted to show you, and I, it was Pastor Ted in out. bed, 
reading the Bible and talking about, and I turned out, I said, we can't show them that. I didn't even film that. My husband filmed it. Because yeah. by then, my husband and I were, you know, it was, it was interchangeable. Here, you take the camera. Oh, no, you go. No. And, and, he and was comfortable I, with both of us. He was comfortable with both of us, but I thought he, well, he got in, he took his clothes off and got in bed and decided to open up with when my husband in the room, so I decided to leave. Uh, well, but, I mean, for the, for the film, for the art, but, of course. Uh, for the and art. And my husband was sitting there just... You know, so tell me, Pastor Ted, getting deep. And, and poor, my husband was like poor. this Dutch lawyer who yeah. I met at a film festival in Hall. Like he had, he was not a filmmaker. He was just, he, I. But he Ted, trained in the Alexander Ted Pelosi was school. reading the Bible on his iPhone, and and it was a very actually it was an intimate moment. We didn't have time to show it to you tonight. But the thing about Ted is he became part of your life. I, I think it's Al Mazel, the, the great documentarian, who says something like, "These people are in your life forever," and I do feel like Ted has become family of sorts. I Is think I'd have fair? a great, I could have a great party with all the people I made films <laughs> about. The thing I think is if, I don't know if you've noticed yet, but somehow you started in media critique and with a presidential candidate, then president, and somehow the conversation keeps going. There, there is a through line. If you sat, not that I'm saying you're going to, but if you sat and watched all the films back to back, you'd see a, a, they all reference back to each other. There is a conversation that's going on with the people who watch my films. Yeah. And that with the people who I've made them with. I've made them with Lisa Heller and Sheila Nevins from HBO. And, and somehow it's a conversation that has, we've kept going for and 10 years. And it does seem like each one informs the next in some way. Um, and at a certain point though, we said, Alexandra, get off the road. We want you to stay in one place and look at an issue, which was unusual, right? We were talking about unemployment and the economy. Right. And we didn't really know how to get into it, but Alexandra had been doing these road trip films, which are very hard, which we should talk about at some point if we have time, creating a story out of a road trip, because it's not simple. Um, but in this case, you stayed in one place, a flea-infested hotel in Orange County, California. Um, and it, it, you, you danced around before you landed there. I think you went to a tent city, right? Um, just to try to find a story we hadn't seen in the mainstream media about um, the economy. And you landed on this next one. Should we look at the clip first? Yeah, let's look at the clip. What is home to you? Home? I don't really know what that means. Once you're here in the motel, it's so hard to get out. You know, you're paying weekly and with the economy, it's difficult. What's it like living at the motel? It's like you're in hell. If you could have one wish come true, what would it be? Redo my life. The economy's going down. We're not feeling it because <laughs> we're already there. We have to be together no matter what. We have to live in the same room. There's no walls besides the four walls that we all share. God can only give you the things you really need. So what do you hope for this summer? I hope for a house. So this was very different. That's when I grew a heart because I had kids. Well, so I think that's actually an interesting point. I, made, my, I brought my kids with me to the homeless motels in Orange County. It wasn't just one motel, there were different motels. We were but how at. did you find that? I forget how you landed how you landed Well, there. we like the fact that it was Disneyland. These are all hotels that are across the street from Disneyland. And so it's rich, poor. You know, it's one of the Happy, richest sad. places in America, happiest places on earth. And still, we're getting the wrap-up sign. Okay. So let's wrap it up. No, no, no. Finish a few minutes on Homeless because I, I, I think it's a very different film from the rest of the pieces. What was it like to be your what was shy, was demure self with children? I mean, how did you shape, how did your, your approach change when you were dealing with kids? Because Well, this was different. dealing with people, really living with people and having to deal with their problems for more than just a weekend. I actually knew these people and watched them, and it never went up, it was just going down and down, and you wanted to help, but you couldn't. But what was interesting was that I had my own kids there, and they didn't really notice that these kids, they would say, why are their feet dirty? Or how come they have holes in their shoes? But they didn't really notice the, you know, the class thing. And it's funny because, you know, your parents always said, you eat your food because there are people starving in other countries. It's like, no, eat your food because there are people starving in Orange County. And I remember the time I got really mad at my son Thomas when we were going to a soup kitchen for dinner 
Because I thought, well, you can't just go film and then go stay at the Ritz Carlton, right? That's weird, right? But so all the kids were getting bed bugs, and it was like a, not a good place to have kids. And so I thought it was time that they leave. And, but I wanted them to go to the soup kitchen for dinner. And he was crying, and he was like two years old or something. He said, I don't want to eat in the soup kitchen tonight. I was like, yeah, well, lucky for you, you have a choice. You can go back to the Holiday Inn and have a real mm -hmm. meal. These kids don't have a choice. And so that was, th this is when the films start to get really sort of deep and heavy and weigh on your heart. And these are the ones that live with you. I and don't live with Ted Haggard every day. I live with these kids. Yeah, and these are the ones you would call in from the road, sort of, I think I'm bringing a couple kids home with me. <laughs> um, and you really, um, staying in one spot for longer than a, a few days made a huge difference. And so I think we should, we, we're getting the wrap up sign, we're gonna have to skip a couple of films, but they're on HBO Go. Um, or they will be by tomorrow somehow. Um, well, um, let me bring but, it to the movie they're about say, to see. Yeah, Let's because see I think show. we should just quickly talk about Jim McGreevy, which you also stayed in one place. And unlike the other films, this is a film we didn't want to do. Um, Alexander, for some reason that I still don't quite understand, became fascinated with the former governor, Jim McGreevy, the former governor of New Jersey. And we said, really? Why? Go back out on the road, do your thing, do your wacky road thing. Um, and, sh and you insisted on this, and you went out on your own, really, and, and came back and said, look at this, and we saw the magic. But what, why were you so committed to Jim and his story? It brought all of the films together in some strange way. It had the politics, it had the religion, because he wants to be a priest now, and he was tortured. Why he says he stays in the closet, you can challenge that, but he says he stayed in the closet so long was because of, he was raised Catholic, and that put a big stain on his heart. And it had the women in prison who all had kids at home. And so, ironically, it, it, it captures so it movie all magic the different you. topics that I had been interested in in one film in less than 45 minutes. <laughs> Which is a perfect way to start the 45 minute film. Um, Fall to Grace by Alexander Pelosi, our, our next brilliant insta installment from um, this wonderful filmmaker. And we'll be in the back, right? Thank you. Hanging out. I'll be Thank here to so answer much. questions after if you Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heller. Mm -hmm.